Okay, good morning. Nice to see all of you. I'm sure many of you, if not all of you, saw in the news what happened last week, this flight from JFK to Frankfurt, where you had over 100 Jews, most of them Hasidic Jews, who, according to the reports, some of them were not compliant with the instructions of uh, the cabin crew in wearing their masks for the duration of the flight. And right now with air travel, different airlines and different destinations have different policies. But when they landed in Germany at the airport in Frankfurt, an airport that I've been to many, many times, uh, they were basically singled out and anyone visibly orthodox was not allowed to board the connecting flight to Budapest. This was. Uh, a large group who were traveling to go to the grave of Shailov Kerestir, who was a, a Hasidic Rebbe, and there were all sorts of different uh, schulot associated with this Rebbe. He was uh, considered to be a miracle worker and known for his acts of kindness. And so for his Yerid site, many Hasidim go and they pray at his grave. And so this was a pilgrimage, so to speak. So they were on their way to Hungary, and they were basically told, no, you cannot board because you were not compliant with the instructions of the flight attendants, with the cabin crew, and anyone who was not Jewish or wasn't visibly Orthodox or visibly Hasidic was allowed to board. So uh, there were people who said, wait a minute, I wore my mask for the duration of the flight the entire time. Why am I being punished? But there was some sort of collective punishment and they felt that they were being singled out for being Jewish. Maybe it was anti-Semitism. The fact that it was a German carrier and a German airport, you know, I think only made matters worse for many of them. And, and they felt that they were being targeted for being Jewish because you know, maybe there were a handful of people who didn't follow the instructions, but according to the ports, most of them did. So, uh, you know, it, it, it was all over the media and, and on websites and videos. And uh, I, I saw this morning that Lufthansa issued an apology, but certainly does not good. It does not look good for the airline, and uh, you know, especially in light of, of all of, of our shared history with with Germany. But uh, it certainly does not look good for the airline. But you know, this of course raises some questions in terms of what should be our behave, behavior as, as visibly Orthodox Jews while on airplanes, right? Uh, you know, I remember even as a child when we would go on some sort of school trip, you know, we were told, boys, make sure you don't make a chilul Hashem, you make a kiddush Hashem, you're wearing your yarmulkes, right? So, you know, how do we behave when we are out in public, when we are traveling uh, on airplanes, visibly orthodox? And so I'd like to explore together with you this morning airplane etiquette in halacha, okay? And... Uh, you know, certainly for anyone who travels, this is, this is a, a scene that you're all quite familiar with. You know, you are in your seat, you have your seatbelt on, your luggage is properly stowed in the overhead compartment above you or below the seat in front of you. You're following the instructions of the flight crew, and then you're asked if you would kindly move your seat somewhere else because some individual on the plane does not want to sit next to a woman and, you know, wants you to move your seat. And of course, this causes delayed departures as the cabin crew tries to attempt to accommodate such passengers and play this game of musical chairs. It's certainly happened to me a number of times flying between Israel and the United States or other destinations. I'm sure it's happened to you or you've seen it before. So the first question is, is it permitted for a man to sit next to a woman on an airplane, according to Jewish law? And then we'll talk about uh, davening on an airplane and minyanim on airplanes. But just simply, is it permitted for a man to sit next to a woman? I've certainly got this request before. Sir, would you kindly move your seat? Would you be so kind? I said, well, you know, can you upgrade me to business class or maybe first class for being so accommodating? <laughs> Or at least give me an aisle seat. Okay. Um, but uh, in any case, in the Torah, in Vayikra Yudchet, in the context of the Arayot, the forbidden relationships, the Torah says, Lo tik legalot erva. You're not even to come close to revealing nakedness. Which means that 
We cannot come close. It doesn't have to be an act of, of, of uh, illicit relations even, but the Torah warns not even, not even to come close. And according to the Rambam, the prohibition from the Torah to come close means, and this is, he records this in Hilchot Yisribi, it means that you're not allowed to even touch a member of the opposite sex who's not permitted to you. Okay, if it's not your spouse, if it's someone that's not permitted to you, if it's someone that's prohibited to you, according to the Rambam, it's a Torah prohibition to touch such an individual in an affectionate way, in an affectionate way. The Rambam qualifies this in the 21st chapter of his Hilchot Yisurei Bia. So it's a lo ta'ase mina Torah. It's a Torah prohibition. It's a, a negative commandment. However, the Ramban disagrees, and the Ramban understands, no, it's merely a rabbinic prohibition. The rabbis made a siyag, a fence around the Torah, and according to the rabbis, you're not allowed to touch one who is not permitted to you. You know, I remember, I think I first learned about this in NCSY. You know, you're in junior high school, you come to NCSY, and all of a sudden you learn about something called Shomer Nagia. You're not allowed to touch girls, okay? So, uh, as we know, you don't touch someone who's not permitted to you, okay? But what about sitting next to a member of the opposite sex who's not your spouse on a bus or a train or an airplane? Is that a violation of this prohibition, whether it's biblical or rabbinic in nature, right? We, we Orthodox Jews follow both Torah laws as well as rabbinic law, right? Uh, we're not Karaites here, at least I hope we're not uh, Karaites or Samaritans that reject rabbinic law or Sadducees. So whether the nature of the prohibition is biblical or rabbinic, what about sitting next to a member of the opposite sex or brushing up against them, right? Uh, what if you are traveling during rush hour, in the morning hours or in the afternoon, and the, the buses are packed, and you're packed in there like sardines, and you're literally pressed up against other people. Is that permitted? So here in source number one, I put a tshuva of Rav Moshe Feinstein. It's in the second chelek of Evan Ha'ezer in the Grot Moshe. And Rav Moshe has asked this very question. What about travel in New York City during rush hour on the buses or subway lines, when you're literally packed in like sardines and can't help but brushing up against a member of the opposite sex. So Rav Moshe writes the following, B'inyan, where I've underlined, B'inyan halicha, b'subway, o b'bus, buses, buses, he writes, b'sha she'i afshar li zaher minigia, u'dechifa banashim, mitzad adochak. He's asked about, or concerning, this very question, travel on subways or buses when uh, you're packed in like sardines, and it's not possible not to touch a member of the opposite sex because of the, the, the dochak, the, the, the crush, the amount of people there, the crowd. Okay? So uh, take a look where I've underlined. Next, bidavar halicha besubway, ubibuses, bizman shalchim bene adam lavodatam, shenimtsaim shama nashim venashim duchufim zebaze, at a time when people are literally pressed up once again, once against another against each other. It's very hard to prevent yourself from, from touching and being pressed up against women. Is it permitted to travel during those hours? In other words, maybe, I don't know, you got to get up early and travel before rush hour, right? Or after, okay. Okay. Now, this is so important. He writes that touching or, or pressing up against a woman is not prohibited. There is no prohibition whatsoever. Why? Because that is not called touching in an intimate way or affectionate way. It's not touching out of lust, or love, or desire, chiba v'ta'ava. It's not affectionate touching, you're just grazing. I would, I would use the word grazing, right? You're pressed up against them, you're grazing against them, but it's not affectionate touching, right? 
וכל איסור נגיע באריות הוא אף להרמב״ם שסובר שהוא בלאו דלא תקרבו דאורייתא דווקא דרך תאווה כמפורש בדבריו ריש פרק כ"א מאיסורי ביאה. And this is what we said before. He said, even according to the Rambam, who believes the nature of the prohibition to be biblical, he believes there's a lo ta'ase, it's a lav, it's a negative commandment, lo tikrivu legalot erva, that one who touches, not even has to engage in relations, but just touching in an affectionate way is in violation of this Torah prohibition, according to the Rambam. But that he qualifies, the Rambam qualifies himself and writes, that's when the touching is affectionate in nature, okay? If it's not affectionate in nature, so there is no prohibition whatsoever. Umashma, and he continues, Shebelo derech ta'ava, leka af isur midi rabbanan, shelo yizkir zeh. And according to the Rambam, if it's not affectionate touching, then it's not even prohibited by the rabbis. It's not even a rabbinic prohibition. The Rambam does not mention that. So in other words, and only to be in, viola- in order to be in violation of this Isur, and it's okay, it's a serious Isur, the rabbis, either the, the, the Torah prohibited us to touch in an affectionate way lest it lead to something more serious, or the rabbis prohibited us to touch lest it lead to something more serious. But the nature of the prohibition aside, it's only prohibited if it is affectionate in nature. Casual touch, grazing against someone on a bus or a subway, is not included in the prohibition. And therefore he writes, it's permitted, and he gives as an example, where I've underlined next, Pashut she'erofim Yisraelim, mimash meshim, hadafek shel isha, filu isha, filu eshet ish, o nachrit. He says, what about doctors? Doctors, you know, touch and examine women, even if they're married women, eshet ish, o nachrit, or a non-Jewish woman, why? Because it's clinical, right? I'd use the word clinical. Hopefully, when a doctor examines his patient, it's purely clinical, and it's not affectionate. Okay, obviously they're sick individuals, and there's stories of doctors taking advantage of people. But that aside, you know, we assume that that's a small percent of the population. Most doctors are healthy, normal individuals, and it's purely clinical. So the, uh, Rav Moshe continues and says, well, we allow that even when it's below sakana. The rabbis allow that. The Chachamim discuss this even in the Gemara, and that's even when it's not in a place of sakana. It's not a pikuach nefesh or a tzalat nefashot. We're not saying that a, you know, a doctor is permitted to touch a woman so long as it's to save her life. No, no, no. Even if it's, again, a routine examination, it's permitted because it's not affectionate in nature. It's purely clinical, okay? And then Rav Moshe continues towards the end of the tshuva and and writes, well, what if a person, though, is concerned that he may come to have impure thoughts sitting next to a woman on a bus or on a subway or on an airplane, for instance, what if it's going to lead him to become aroused, chas v'shalom? So, uh, Rav Moshe writes, if he knows himself, that he cannot control himself, so yeah, for such an individual, maybe such an individual should not travel in such a way. If being put in such a situation, being pressed up against a member of the opposite, opposite sex is going to cause him to become aroused and then sin, so maybe then in such a case, such an individual should not travel. But Rav Moshe continues and writes, Chas v'shalom, that a person should be like that. Chas v'shalom, that a, that a person should be thinking such things, and instead he should follow the advice of the Rambam, that instead he should focus his mind on Torah. Focus his mind on Divrei Torah. That's what the Rambam says. Instead of being concerned, well, I don't know, I can't go on a bus or a train or sit next to a woman for the duration of the flight because I'm going to have impure thoughts. Chas v'shalom, that a person should be, behave like that. Right? Certainly that's not a typical healthy person, but such an individual, okay, either he shouldn't travel or, no, chas v'shalom, he should instead focus his mind on Torah, bring a sefer along, okay, have his nose in his gemara. I'm sorry? What year was this? Tuf Shin Chaf. So we're talking about 1960. 
Okay, but things, things haven't changed since 1960. The New York City subways are still crowded, right? Rav Moshe's addressing maybe the situation in, in, uh, in, in New York City, uh, the subways and buses during rush hour in New York City. Um, you know, I remember when we first moved here to Israel in uh, Tammuz of Tavshin Samechtet, July 2009. We live in Harnof, and one of the lines on Harnof was known as the Mahadran line, where men and women had to sit separately. Women had to sit in the back of the bus, okay? Kind of <laughs> evokes something else from uh, the, the checkered past of, of the United States in the South, but um, uh, they did away with that. But in any case, um, yeah, I, I, again, uh, they, they, tell of, they tell of Rav Shlomo Zalman Arbach, who used to take the buses like everyone else, you know, the uh, Gadol Hador, that when, when uh, he'd be sitting on the bus and a woman who wasn't dressed properly would get on the bus and sit next down, uh, sit down right next to him, that he would, he would wait until the next stop to get off the bus, even if it was before the stop that he was planning on exiting, because he didn't want to embarrass a woman. So even if a person wants to be machmir, okay, and, and listen, uh, you know, uh, once uh, someone wants to, to be machmir, we've spoken in the past about chumrah here, a person wants to be machmir, tavolav bracha, you should be blessed, but it shouldn't be at anyone else's expense. And that's something that we'll return to this morning, um, and there are, by the way, poskim um, that are machmir. You find similar rulings to that of Rav Moshe in the chuvot of Rav Avad Yehidaya, the Yaskil Avdi, who we've spoken about in the past in his Chelek Even Ha'ezer, the fifth Chelek, as well as uh, the Mishnah Halachot of Menashe Klein in the fourth Chelek of the Mishnah Halachot. Um, uh, you have different poskim who uh, I, I found an interview with with Rav Avraham Yosef, right, the brother of the current chief rabbi, who uh, was asked about Mahadran bus lines. I mentioned this Mahadran line that uh, when we moved to Harnov, there was a Mahadran line going from Harnov. So uh, he called separate seating on buses unnecessary, I saw. Um, so, you know, you, you have many post scheme that permit one to sit next to a woman on a bus or a subway or a train, and the same would be true about an airplane. But there are those who are machmir. The Shevet Halevi, Rav Shmuel Halevi Vosner, was a major posek. He, he was machmir, and he was concerned that even casual contact may lead to impure thoughts. And therefore, he ruled that it's preferable for an individual to stand rather than sit next to a woman. Okay, a person wants to stand and give his seat up to a woman, gives him to hey, why not? Okay, by the way, I'll just mention, if you're going to be very machmir about this issue, which according to some is only rabbinic and really only a chumrah because it's only in violation if it's an affectionate type of touch, right? So if you want to be machmir in this area, make sure you're also machmir on the mitzvah min ha-torah, mipnei seva takum, standing when a senior adult comes, or you know, I would add to that someone with mobility issues, okay? Someone who has a hard time standing on a bus for whatever reason, or a, a pregnant woman, okay? You wanna be machmir in this area, even though Rav Moshe says it's permitted, and many posts can say it's permitted to sit next to a woman, you wanna be machmir here, make sure you're also machmir with the mitzvah min ha-Torah to honor uh, senior adults and stand when they come and uh, give your seat to them, okay? I'm sorry? Excellent, Excellent idea. Okay. Um, so, yeah, so uh, the Shevet Halevi rules, it's better to be machmer because he's concerned that even casual touch may lead to impure thoughts. And some say you're sitting on an airplane or, you know, sleeping on an airplane for all of those hours. Who knows, you know? Okay. Listen, a person has to know himself. If a person has problems, so then, you know, maybe he shouldn't uh, fly next to a woman if he can't control himself. But in any case, you want to be machmer and stand hey, okay, so you can stand during the duration of the flight, and excluding uh, takeoff and landing and when the captain puts on the fasten seatbelt sign, okay? Or you want to be really machmir? Purchase a seat in business or first class, right? Then you have plenty of room. You're not 
pressed up against anyone. The problem is that in the economy and on many airlines, you know, you're, you're, you are pressed up against your neighbor. But, uh, okay, you want to be machmir, so either stand or purchase a flight in business or first class. Okay, but never be machmir at someone else's expense. And, and, and of course, that includes making a chilu Hashem, lo techalalu et shem kodshi. Right? And again, we've all seen how, how people have uh, argued with, with flight attendants and uh, caused delayed departures, etc. Not nice. Not nice. Right, 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 right. Oh, again, you know, I, I, I've, I've been asked to move my seat. And look, assuming that they're going to give me an equivalent seat, um, I don't mind. But, but it should never be at someone else's expense. Okay, and, and so the next, the next uh, question is, what about davening on an airplane? We've all seen people davening on an airplane. We've seen minyanim on an airplane. Okay, the last time I flew, and by the way, I have a trip leaving next week. I'll be away for the next two Wednesday mornings. I think they'll have someone fill in for me, um, but I'll be away. I'll be traveling. I have some speaking engagements in North America. Uh, but the last time I flew, I used all these points that I'd saved up and hadn't used for the two years when <laughs> all the flights were, were canceled and the skies were closed due to corona. And so I got myself one of these really nice fancy seats with all the extra leg room by an emergency exit, by the galley kitchen, right? And, um, and then, you know, of course... In the middle of, uh, of the flight, uh, the schever comes, and they feel like right in front of my extra legroom is a perfect place to make a minion, right? <laughs> to make a minion. And, you know, listen, I, 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 you know, I, I, I'm, not, I'm not going to you know, uh, tell them not to do it, but uh, I don't need to. Many posts can say not to do it, as we'll, we'll mention in a few moments. But um, the problem there, too, is that oftentimes it's at other people's expense, you know, they're putting on their the tally tote and, and whipping people in the face with the uh, tzitzit or waking up sleeping passengers, being disruptive, uh, bothering the flight crew, uh, distracting the flight crew. Uh, actually, on that very flight, there was turbulence, of course, right when they were in the middle of the Shmona Esrei. In the middle of the Amida, the plane starts to go like this. The, cabin, uh, the, the captain puts on the fast and seatbelt sign. Everyone is asked to return to their seat, except these 15 guys that are shuckling away. And, you know, of course, uh, the Mishnah says that even if a snake is crawling up your leg, you're not allowed to stop davening, right? So, by the way, the, the, the Mishnah, uh, the Gemara qualifies that. and says that's only if it's not a poisonous snake. Right? If it's a poisonous snake or a scorpion, if your life is in danger, of course you stop davening. And, <laughs> and, and the same would be true if you're on an airplane that's going like this and potentially you're in danger. And you know, even, even if chaz v'shalom, it doesn't, it doesn't lead to the airplane, God forbid, going down or anything. But uh, I've been on, on airplanes where there was such bad turbulence, the overhead compartments open and luggage starts flying and of course you know how many you know you know how israelis like to pack their <laughs> carry-ons right <laughs> right you're only allowed one carry-on and one personal item but as many duty-free bags as you want right and uh, and so they have their bottles of liquor and their cigarettes and their carry-ons that weigh you know 100 pounds so uh and, and, uh, and it could really be dangerous if people are not seated. They could fly and drop on other people. I've, I've been on airplanes and just had people walking. I, I, before the pandemic, used to fly very frequently. I've had people end up in my lap on an airplane. Just, they're just walking, and there's a little turbulence. They're walking back to their seat, and, and they end up in my lap. I take an aisle seat, typically, and they end up in my lap. I've gotten drinks poured in my lap. <laughs> from flight attendants, and I've had people end up literally in my lap. In my lap. you see, time, a lot of times people have to grab the, you know, the, 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 the chairs, the backs of the seats to get back to where they're sitting. So, uh, is that a, is that appropriate? And what are the guidelines for tefillah on an airplane? Of course, tefillah is important. We believe a person has to daven, right? But should a person make 
a minion. How should one navigate, no pun intended, how should one navigate davening on an airplane? Okay, so, you know, uh, the Chachmei Talmud, the, the rabbis of the Mishnah and the Gemara, they already understood that sometimes you're going to ha- have to travel while uh, sometimes you're going to have to travel, and sometimes you're going to have to daven while traveling. Right? The Chachamim already dealt with this scenario. So take a look at source number two. This is from the Mishnah in the fourth perek of Masechet Brachot. Hayarochev al hachamor. Okay? A person is riding on his donkey, and comes time to daven. Okay? So, so the Mishnah first instructs Yered. He should get off his donkey. If he can't get off of his donkey, he should continue riding and daven while on his donkey, while traveling on his donkey, and he should turn his face towards Jerusalem. But if he can't turn in the direction of Jerusalem, so he should direct his heart towards the Holy of Holies, Right, towards the Kodesh HaKodoshim in the Beit HaMikdash. And the next Mishnah, What if a person is sitting on a boat? Now, interesting, sitting on a boat doesn't say standing on a boat. You'd think, well, I mean, don't you have to stand for tefillah? Interesting that the Mishnah says one is sitting on a boat, or in a wagon, or in some sort of raft, in such a case, we assume he, he doesn't know which direction is Jerusalem. He's somewhere in the middle of the sea. I mean, hopefully he knows which direction he's sailing in. Hopefully he's going to get to his destination. Hopefully there's someone navigating the ship. But the individual praying doesn't know really which direction to face while davening. So he should direct his heart towards Jerusalem, towards the Holy of Holies in the Beit HaMikdash. Now, that's true, by the way, whether one is traveling or not traveling. If a person doesn't know exactly where Jerusalem is or exactly where, if he's in Jerusalem, the Kodesh HaKodoshim is, so you just intend that your tefillot should, should travel there, okay? But the Gemara here in source number three cites a b'rita. Right? We said if a person is traveling on a donkey, he should ideally, it sounds from the Mishnah, get off of the donkey. But the Brayta would seem qualifies this, or really modifies this. Ten Rabbanan, Haya Rochev al Hachamor Vihigiazman Tfila. The Brayta is more expansive. It says if a person is riding on a donkey and it's time now to Davin, Imieshlo Mishe Yochazet Hamuro. If he has someone to hold on to his donkey, right? Maybe he's concerned the donkey is going to run away. Yered lamatavit palel. He should, in that case, descend from his donkey, get off the donkey, and daven. Ve'im laf. But if he does not have anyone to hold onto his donkey, yeshev bim komovit palel. He should sit where he is, stay where he is. Right? He doesn't have to get off the donkey and daven there. Meaning, daven while he's Riding, okay. Rebbe Omer, Rebbe Yehuda Nasi says, Ben kach u ben kach. No, no, no. Whether he has someone to hold on to the donkey or whether he does not have someone, yeshev bim komovit palel. He can daven in a seated position while traveling on his donkey. Why? Lefish in da'ato miushevet alav. Because his mind is not at rest. He doesn't have the proper peace of mind while traveling. And so there's this allowance for him to daven while on the road, while traveling. We don't make him stop, okay? Because he cannot have the proper frame of mind. Which means he won't have proper kavana for tefillah. Tefillah requires kavana. What type of kavanah is required? That's beyond the scope of our discussion this morning, but he has to be able to focus on his tefillah. What parts of tefillah require kavanah? Again, beyond the scope of our discussion this morning. But Rabbi Yudah Hanasi, he has this special allowance for one who is mid-travel to continue to travel and daven. He need not, he need not get off the 
the donkey. Amar Rava v'itema Rabbi Yoshua ben Levi halacha kerebi. And we say that the halacha is in accord with Rabbi Yehuda Hanasi. That's how we paskin. In other words, we don't allow, we, we don't require, rather. We don't require one to, to, to get off the donkey. And Rashi explains, what does it mean that he, he doesn't have the presence of mind? She'en da'atom yushevet alav. Rashi explains, she'kashe alav ikuv haderech. He's concerned about getting late to his destination. Well, what does that mean? Could be that, you know, this is before there were street lights. This is when there were highway robbers. Right? Doesn't mean necessarily, literally, that he's concerned about getting there late, right? Getting there late. I mean, does it matter you know, if he gets there at six o'clock or seven o'clock? How long is it gonna take him to Davin, right? Especially when we're talking about tefillah here, we're really talking about the Amidah. We're talking about the Shmona Esrei. So how much later is it going to make him? Okay? So it could be that what Rashi really means is he's concerned about being delayed in travel. He's concerned about the Ikuva Derech because back then you could not travel at night. It was very dangerous. You couldn't see the road. The roads were not good. They were not paved. And there were no streets. There were no, there were no street lights. Uh, like certain parts of Israel, <laughs> no street lights. So, uh, but it, it could be implicit in Rashi's comments that there's a concern for danger, and maybe that's why Rabbi Yudha Nasi has this allowance. Even if he's not in immediate danger, right? If he was in immediate danger, of course, you know, he's, he's, he, he can continue and daven along the way. But if he's not in immediate danger, but maybe he's going to end up getting late and then it's going to be dangerous, maybe that's what Rashi's concerned with. So Tosfot here in source number five responds to that and says, you know what, even if there is no danger whatsoever, a person can continue along the way. That's how Tosfot understands this allowance of Rabbi Yehuda Hanasi. Look at Tosfot. Halacha kirebi, we paskin like Rabbi Yehuda Hanasi. Shelo yered lamata. Even if it's not in a place of danger, right? Even if we're not concerned that he's going to get there late and it's going to be dark by then and he's going to be concerned about uh, danger on the road. Even, again, if he's davening along the way. And in such a case, he doesn't have to turn to face Jerusalem. Again, if he's already on the way, he doesn't have to make a U-turn or... <laughs> He doesn't have to put his donkey facing eastward, whatever it is in such a case, okay? Now, uh, there are different explanations in the Rishonim as to how to understand this special allowance because of Ein Datom Yushevet Alav, but this is how we rule. We rule in accord with Rabbi Yudanasi. However, the Rambam understands standing during tefillah to be li'ikuva. The Rambam lists things that one must do during tefillah, and if he does not do them, well then his tefillah doesn't count and he has to go back and daven again. And then the Rambam also lists things that are preferable to do or ideal to do, but if one doesn't do them, eh, it's not the end of the world. He doesn't have to repeat his davening. He doesn't have to daven again. He doesn't have to say the Shemona Esrei again. So there is a discussion in the post scheme. well what about one who davens while seated? Maybe when he gets to his destination, maybe he has to daven again. Okay, and it's interesting. That's how the Shulchan Aruch here in source number six rules. The Shulchan Aruch rules like the Rambam that one must stand for davening, and if he doesn't, it's li'ikuva. And therefore, he rules that if a person does not stand while davening, then he has to go back again and, and daven again. Okay, here in Seif Tet, Mishu Chrachlit Palel Miushav, one who uh, is forced to daven while seated because he's traveling. Right? Again, even according to this allowance, yeah, you can daven while seated, but in such a case, Kishe Yuchal, Sarich Lachsor Vlit Palel Mu'mad, when he can, the Shulchan Aruch rules that he should then go ahead and daven again while standing. He doesn't have to add anything to it. Typically, if a person davens another tefillah, he has to add something to his tefillah. A person, for instance, who oversleeps and <laughs> misses the time to daven shacharit. So, you know, there's a whole discussion of tefillah tashlumin. You can make it up. Right? You can uh, daven two shmona esrays during the next tefillah. 
The first one is for the current tefillah. The second one is the, the makeup one. But that makeup one, it's only if you can add something. You have to be able to add something. Or a person can elect to daven. He wants to speak to Hashem. Okay, what they call a tefillat nidava. A person wants to, you know, is moved. He wants to daven in a tefillah that's not, not formally necessary. Okay? He's already dispensed of his obligation. But for whatever reason, and we say nowadays maybe you shouldn't do it, maybe you don't have the right kavana, but he's supposed to add something to it. You know, new, some new intention, so to speak. It's a whole discussion whether you ask to add one thing to the whole Shemot Esrei or one thing to each bracha. In any case, in such a case where it's a question, again, according to those who believe that standing is essential, it's li kuva, to the tefillah, and therefore you have to repeat the tefillah when you reach your destination. So in such a case, you don't have to add anything to it. But the Mishnah Brura and many others say, nowadays, we don't, we don't paskin like this, this Shulchan Aruch. We don't say, here look at source number seven. The later poskim all agree, writes the Mishnah Brura, There's all the contemporary poskim, the achronim, um, contemporary post I mean, you know, the Mishnah Bura is writing in the early 20th century but uh, you know all the achronim the later poskim rule that you do not have to go back and that people who travel while traveling or da- people who daven who travel while davening daven while traveling um, in such a case they don't, do not have to to, uh, to daven again however um, the Shulchan Aruch and the Mishnah Bura uh, they all say that ideally you should try to put your feet together, even in a seated position. I don't know how you do that while on a donkey or on a horse, maybe unless, what is it called uh, when you ride sideways? English? Side saddle? Okay, thank you. Side saddle? Okay, I see many of you, uh, you know, have experience. Good, okay. Side saddle, I guess then you, if you're riding side saddle, you can put your feet together. And ideally, if possible, if you're on, let's say, a boat or a raft or even in a wagon or on a bus or a train or on an airplane, if one can stand for the kriot when bowing, that's also possible. Um, others like the Shulchan Aruch Harav and, and other contemporary posts can say, if it can wait till you get to your destination, better wait till you get to your destination. In other words, you know, you could, you could take a look at your watch, say, well, what time, what time is my bus arriving at my destination? Right now you have those move it apps, right? Or if you're on, on an airplane, well, you know, they're making a minion now, but maybe, maybe it's better. Maybe I, by the time I land in Newark, right? You know, you can look at your ETA, okay? We know your arrival time. Uh, so what's my ETA? When am I going to land in Newark Airport? And will I have enough time to, what? To go through uh, border control, collect my baggage, get the rental car and make it to Elizabeth, New Jersey for davening there, you know, so, uh, right? So many posts can say that. Ideally, if a person can daven, once they've, they've reached their destination, that is certainly ideal. The only real question is if you're going to miss Zmane Tefillah. And of course, you have all sorts of um, uh, websites now that will calculate, because especially with changes in time when you're flying in different directions you know sometimes you only have a short window to be able to uh, to daven right my riv, you know depending on how you're flying it's only going to be dark for a very short amount of time when to when when can you daven my riv, or when can you daven chakras depending on where you're traveling from and where you're going right i've been to see passing the international dateline i've been to some crazy places and it's and sometimes it's a real question um you know, now we are in the midst of Svirat Omer, depending on where you're traveling and how you're traveling. If you're, you know, you might, you might, you can miss the opportunity perhaps to count, depending on when you leave and where you're going and, and where you're traveling from. You might miss the opportunity to count Svirat Omer. You might be flying into the future and, and skip, you know going the wrong way and skip, skip a, a night or something. And so, so what do you do? All sorts of interesting questions. The Sefirah and Omer, of course, it has to be continuous. The Torah says, Sheva Shabbatot Timimot Tiena. There's this idea of Timimot. You can't miss a night. Okay, if you miss a night, you can say it during the day without a bracha and then count that night, right? We all know the halacha. But it has to be continuous. 
It has to be complete to be mo- Okay. So uh, take a look here at source number nine. Rav Moshe here, he, he discusses davening while on an airplane. Just look at the very end of this tshuva where I've underlined. One who is davening seated in an airplane, right? Rav Moshe understands that you are davening in your seat. You're not making a minion. You're davening in your seat. And you're seated. In other words, uh, you know, the <laughs> pilot has put on, or the captain has put on the fastened seatbelt sign. He says he doesn't have to go back and daven again. Right? We paskin like the Mishnah Bru and others that say that you don't have to go back, even though, of course, you're supposed to stand for davening. But while one is traveling, there's a special allowance, a special exception or dispensation. He could do so while in a seated position. Even lechatchila, right? Lechatchila, David while sitting. Certainly, if it's difficult for him to stand, or if he's not going to be able to properly concentrate, better davening, better daven while sitting. And I would add to this also: if you are standing, is going to bother or wake up the passenger next to you. Vilamod kodam hakriot. Ideally, you should stand for the kriot, for the bows in the amida. Certainly the rest of the tefillah can be said in a seated position. That's not even a question. It's really only the Amidah. Now in this tshuva, Rav Moshe doesn't even address making a minion on an airplane because for him, that's so far outside of the realm of, of, of possibility and what's required. And certainly if you see you know, uh, how Chazal allow one, all these dispensations to daven while traveling, certainly... Um, you know, one is allowed to do so in a way that's going to allow him to have proper concentration and not bother others. Um, we've discussed in the past, uh, after the, the lockdowns, when we returned to our beloved Bate Knesset, we discussed whether Tfilah B'Tzibur is a mitzvah or just a Maila, whether it's a formal requirement, a chova, or, or just an advantage, because Chazal tell us that maybe a, an individual's tfilot, for whatever reason, are not going to be listened to. An individual does not merit, perhaps, having his tfilot to be listened to. But when he davens with a minyan, his tfilot are swept up together with those of the minyan. The word tzibur, I've heard, stands for tzadikim. Benonim and Rishaim. Hopefully, none of us belong to that last category, but there's a power in Tfilah B'Tzibur. Most posts can assume it's a requirement, but again, it's a rich discussion. Uh, we dedicated a whole series of Shiurim at that time to the benefits of davening in the Beit Knesset, as convenient as it was to roll out of my bed, right, and daven on my mere peset together with my neighbors in their mir pasaot and in their gardens and on the street below. As nice as that was, it's not, certainly not ideal. So we spoke about Kiddushat Beit Knesset and the mitzvah of Tefillah B'Tzibur. So as important as Tefillah B'Tzibur is, again, it should not come at other people's expense. And you know, as I said there, I was sitting in my fancy priority seat or preferred seating, whatever it's called nowadays on El Al, with all the extra leg room and I'm getting hit in the face with the, the, uh, the tzitzit and whatever as the chevre is davening. And, and you know, they're blocking the aisle, of course. The, the flight crew cannot pass through and then we have turbulence and the captain puts on the fastened seatbelt sign. And we, we've all seen this before. Um, and, and, and they even will sometimes go around and wake up Passengers that are visibly orthodox to tell them, oh, we're going to daven now. We're going to, you know, here, w- wake up. Like the same way the flight attendants sometimes wake you up for that terrible, hermetically sealed meal, right? That's, that's either h- as hot as a volcano or half frozen, right? <laughs> so. I still love it. You still love it? I didn't have to cook it. You didn't have to cook it. Okay. All right. Maybe. Maybe you can ask after the flight on your way out. Maybe you can ask for some extras to take home. So, yeah. So, so 
uh, just like the flight attendants will wake you up. Uh, oh, would you like to have dinner? No, 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 I'm sleeping. It's, it's 3 a.m. I, I, don't, I don't eat dinner at 3 a.m. Okay, no, thank you. Okay, so, um, but, but they'll, they'll even have the chutzpah. Yes, it's chutzpah to wake you up, to daven with them. I, I think it's a real chutzpah. And in the process, wake up other passengers and passengers that may already have their issues with Orthodox Jews. You know, I've had some very colorful conversations with Israelis uh, on, on flights. And uh, they look at me with my kippah and beard and suit and tie. And although I don't, I don't always wear the suit and tie on an airplane. It's not like Richard Nixon who would sleep in his suit. But, um, you know, I've had some very interesting conversations, colorful conversations. And, and what, I, what I hopefully try to get a, across by the end of our conversation is that, you know, there are Orthodox Jews that are normal. <laughs> okay. There is such a thing. Okay. But, you know, sometimes this causes a real chilul Hashem. So as important as tefillah b'tzibur is, many poskim advise people not to make minyanim on airplanes. Among them, Rav Moshe Feinstein, Rav Vadi Yosef, Rav Shlomo Zalman Arabach, Rav Vosner, Rav Shechter, if we're talking about, you know, contemporary poskim, uh, uh, Rav Shechter. And, um, but what's interesting is El Al announced not too long ago that they are going to experiment with creating a small, a small little shul, a small little area uh, on the airplane to be able to daven. Now that's incredible. You know, you, you, you hear about uh, these very luxurious flights on Etihad or uh, what is it, uh, Emirates, Emirates or Cathay Pacific where on their long haul flights they offer this first class experience where you get an entire room to yourself. It's like a hotel room with a full bed, okay? And shower, right. They have even a bathroom with a shower on an airplane. Imagine, they have to like, you know, bring the water in to give you a nice hot shower so that, well, you have to get to your destination nice and refreshed, of course, and, and clean and feeling good. So if they can do that, why not build a shul on an airplane? You know, I, I always enjoy the fact that here in Israel, when I go to Ben Gurion Airport, before my flight, I can dive in my riv in the shul at the airport, not disrupt anyone or disturb anyone or bother anyone. I can daven mincha when I take my kids to the shopping mall here at Malcha Mall, or when I take my wife to Ikea. <laughs> Besides for the kosher meatballs, kosher Swedish meatballs in Ikea, there's a beautiful shul, furnished, of course, with all sorts of Ikea furniture. Um, but, so look, if, if Elal wants to offer this to their passengers, Gesundheit, hey, if you can make a minion on an airplane and not cause a disturbance and block the aisles and wake up other passengers, be a nuisance or bother other passengers, Gesundheit, hey, okay, why not? Why not? But Chumra, stringency, and one's Personal piety should never come at the expense of others. And so we'll end with this. I put here just a few lines at the bottom of the page in source number 10 from the Sefer Mesilat Yesharim. Okay. This, of course, is the classic work of Musser by the Ramchal, of Moshe Chaim Lutzato, an Italian uh, Kabbalist who lived in the 18th century. And uh, the Ramchal, of Moshe Chaim Lutzato, in his discussion of acquiring chassidut, piety, which is really about going above and beyond the letter of the law. That's what chassidut is. Okay, being machmir upon oneself, going above and beyond. We've spoken about chumr in the past together. So he has a chapter, Perek Chaf, chapter 20, where he discusses bimishkal chassidut. It's a mishkal. You have to weigh it, right? It's not always appropriate to, to be extra pious or to be machmir. So he writes the following, and I think this is so important for those who want to be machmir um, and you know, want to either not sit next to a woman or a member of the opposite sex while on an airplane, or someone who wants to be machmir and wants to daven on an airplane with a minion, right? It's important to weigh that. There has to be a cheshbon, a, a there has to be a shikuladat. 
So he writes, and this is so crucial, uh, this, this line here. Okay. Nim made. What emerges from this, Shabali chased chasidut amiti, one who wants to be truly pious, okay, one who wants to sanctify himself with piety and become truly pious, he has to examine all of his deeds according to the result, okay, according to the outcome. In other words, what's, what's going to be? If I'm machmir in one area, am I going to be mekil in another? Is it going to come at the expense of something else or someone else? Such a, an important line. The person has to examine all of these things and, and determine them in relationship to all the accompanying circumstances. The time, the social environment, the situation, the place, right? Is my act of piety going to come at someone else's expense? If so, then it's not called an act of piety. So if being machmir is going to bring about a kidu shem shamayim, if he's going to sanctify the name of God, then great. If it's going to give God nachat ruach, it's going to give God pleasure, then certainly if it's going to give God satisfaction, absolutely, then he should be machmir in that situation, in that instance, and not do whatever that is, you know, whatever he's refraining from doing, I meaning he's being machmir and not, not engaging in something. If he wants to do that, great, gesund to hey. Right? If a person doesn't want to sit down next to a woman on a subway or a bus or on an airplane, gesund to hey, he can be machmir so long as it's going to cause a kiddush Hashem and going to give nachat ruach to Hashem. If it's going to do the opposite, if it's going to cause a chil Hashem, so then he should not do that because that's not called piety. That's not called chassidut. So the Ramchal is so, so uh, crucial. This, this passage here, so crucial that our personal chumrah should never come at someone else's expense and a person has to weigh. It has to be a shikul adat. A person has to weigh the situation, weigh the pros and cons. He has to look at the situation, the scenario, the environment, okay, the time and place. And with that, I'll take any questions and wish you all a nice flight. <laughs>